Okay, uh, we're going to uh, talk about here chapter 11. Uh, as we kind of skipped it for a bit, uh, so we should go over it. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about modern atomic theory. Uh, we're really going to talk about electrons, uh, sort of what happens as they move from one energy level to the next. And we'll talk about electron configuration and a little bit of periodic trends to officially go over it, even though I think we sort of covered it earlier. So as we talked about with uh, Rutherford, uh, he basically described an atom as having this large uh, sort of positive core, uh, which is known as the nucleus. Uh, and uh, with, we have our negatively charged electrons flying around. So remember, you know, we have this, this large positive charge here. Uh, that's from our protons being present. We have our neutrons that have no uh, charge. And out in that empty space in the atom, we have our electrons, again, moving around pretty randomly about the nucleus. Is an attraction between the electrons, which are negatively charged, and the nucleus, which is positively charged overall because of the protons. Um, <clears throat> as we also talked about, really, the nucleus is a very small sort of size compared to the rest of the atom uh, where the electrons are traveling. Uh, so in this chapter, we're really going to talk about sort of where electrons are sort of found in the atom. But before we get there, a lot of the work done to sort of understand this uh, has a lot to do with uh, radiation and waves. Uh, so one earliest sort of uh, work uh, was done by Planck. Uh, he heated a bunch of salt and he noticed that uh, energy coming off um, would only really come off in whole number multiples, uh, which is sometimes referred to as a quanta of energy. And that's basically the energy can be released in the certain uh, definite amounts. So in relationship to what we're, we're talking about is the idea of, for example, electrons on different energy levels. And if an electron was to gain energy and end up on a higher energy level, if those lines represent energy levels, uh, it would gain enough energy to make that transition and the same idea is as they lose electron or lose energy, uh, the electrons would lose energy to make it uh, back down to another energy level. So if you had a bunch of energy levels, for example, and you had electrons sort of transitioning, the idea here, quantized energy is it will gain enough to be fully on one level or the other. It will never sort of find itself between energy levels, just kind of hanging out, bless you, uh, between them. So they either gain or lose energy enough to fully make it uh, from one energy level to the next. And that's what the idea of quantized energy is. And we'll see a picture of it later, but it's sort of also sometimes referred to kind of like a staircase sort of idea. When you walk upstairs, you have enough energy to get to this stair, this stair, this stair. Uh, usually when you walk upstairs, don't stop halfway between and go, eh, I don't really got enough energy to kind of get between there because you're going to fall. And that's sort of how electrons transition. They, again, will either gain enough energy uh, to fully transition upwards to one energy level, two energy levels, whatever it may be, and transition downward the same. And just like when we somebody walks stairs, you know, somebody could do one stair at a time. Maybe somebody could do two stairs at a time and so forth. Uh, and they have enough energy to do those sort of transitions. And that's for the idea there, again, of, of quantized energy. Uh, so we'll never find an electron usually just kind of between energy levels. They'll either be on a certain energy level or another energy level, but never sort of between. So to understand this idea of Planck, uh, we have to know a little bit about radiation. Radiation is basically the emission or transmission of energy uh, through space in the form of waves. So basically, energy is basically going to be carried out through space in the form of these waves. And the idea of the law of conservation of energy is that we don't lose nor create any energy. So in order for, for example, electrons to transition upwards, they do need to gain a certain amount of energy. And when they do want to kind of come back down to a lower state of energy, uh, those electrons have to give off a certain amount of energy. And again, that energy is usually given off in the form of a wave. So let's talk a little bit about waves here. A wave can be thought of as a disturbing um, <clears throat> disturbance by which energy is transmitted. 
Uh, the speed of the wave does depend on sort of what it's traveling in. And there's our bird enjoying his stay at the beach. And the wave is actually passing through him as it goes up and down. Speaking of which, we know waves carry energy, as we'll talk about, right? If you've ever been at the beach or in the water and you got hit by a wave, you know it, it carries a certain amount of energy as it clobbers you down. Um, so energy is going to be transmitted through space. And the wavelength is uh, the distance really between any peak or trough. So kind of between two peaks would be lambda and the wavelength or even two troughs. In terms of wavelength, I would say very commonly meters, centimeters, and nanometers are very common units. Probably the big two on wavelength is meters and nanometers. Nano is like 10 to the minus nine. So that's a very um, conversion that you use a lot. Uh, frequency, uh, which is new, is uh, the number of waves that pass through a particular point in a given second. Uh, it usually has units of a hertz or a reciprocal second, and they are kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. So a hertz is basically the same thing as a reciprocal second. Uh, so very common frequency is given, like I said, in hertz. Uh, like when you tune your radio to 95.5 megahertz is the frequency. Um, and again, uh, if you do see a hertz, it's the same as a reciprocal second. The amplitude is really from the midpoint of the uh, peak there to the, the base there is the amplitude of a wave. You could calculate the speed of a wave by taking the wavelength times the frequency. And that's because if you just look at units for, say, the speed of the wave, Wavelengths in meters, uh, basically frequency is one over seconds. So you get some type of speed of like meters per second when you kind of multiply those guys together. And that's a very common sort of unit of speed of a particular wave. Any questions on those there? Now, late uh, light behaves like uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, which again is that emission of energy in the form of these waves. Uh, they do have sometimes electromagnetic radiation does have properties that are very characteristic of particles. And sometimes they do have, it's very consistent of waves. So it's oftentimes when you talk about this type of stuff here, people mention like the dual nature of light, uh, it could have a wave-like function and also a particle-like function. Uh, and particles can have wave-like functions and act as particles. So there's sort of this dual nature. And then later on, they'll sort of use waves uh, to describe what's happening with something, for example, like an electron. Um, and they both can have sort of particles and wave-like function, uh, both of these things, electrons included, which is what we're talking about here. So one uh, can think of basically a beam of light traveling through space as a tiny packet of energy, which are called photons. And this is sort of the idea as, for example, an electron gets sort of promoted up to a higher energy level. These are energy levels. Electrons do want to always sort of be in a lower state of energy. So as it sort of comes back down, it will give off that energy again in the form of a photon of light. Now, depending on the wavelength of that uh, photon of light, it may be something where you can visibly, uh, visibly see it uh, like a color if it falls in the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, if it falls maybe outside of that and they say the infrared part, you may feel heat coming off. Um, <clears throat> you've all sort of done this maybe. And, in a lot of cases, I don't know if you ever boiled water and then maybe overboiled. Uh, when the water hits the flame, the flame changes. If obviously, if you're boiling with some type of flame, um, it'll change color, and that's really the uh, like sodium ions, basically electrons being excited, and you'll see that sort of about as those guys get a little excited and they release back down, and you see the color. We also see this as a sort of the idea behind 
like fireworks as well. When you uh, launch off fireworks, they explode, provides a lot of energy, excites all the electrons and those elements that are inside the fireworks. As they relax back down, they give off energy in the visible part of the spectrum. And we see colors like purples and greens and all that kind of stuff as they sort of explode. Now there is a relationship uh, between sort of the wavelength and energy. So if we have a longer wavelength, something like this, where it's just kind of moseying through space, uh, which is much longer wavelength. Um, it is a lower energy and also a lower frequency. And that's different than when we have a wave that has a much shorter wavelength. And with a wave that has a much shorter wavelength, uh, we have a higher frequency. It occurs a lot more often. And that's usually associated with higher energy. So speaking of sort of like firework example or where we see colors, even within colors, as we will see, uh, there is a difference between energy between, say, red and violet, for example. Uh, violet actually being more higher in energy than the red color that you would see. So um, there's a lot of energy associated with the wavelength of those waves that are coming out. And again, we could think of these waves as having wavelength function and also can be thought of as like a stream of particles basically moving through uh, in these sort of packets of energy. And there you can see our red color, much longer wavelength versus our bluish color uh, has a shorter wavelength. So this guy here should be higher in energy. And that should be a little bit lower in energy because of this color. Now, what does that have to do with maybe electrons transitioning? By the color that you maybe see coming off, you can make an assumption as to how many energy levels, for example, an electron may be transferred. So if you had an electron and it transferred from way up here all the way down, say four energy levels, that would be a lot more energy. And maybe you see a color closer to the blue. If you saw like an electron start at the second energy level and just drop to the first energy, that's not as much energy. So maybe that would give off more of a red type color as it's not that much energy coming off. So, you know, based on the color, for example, that you see, I could also make sort of an assumption as to how far perhaps uh, those electrons traveled to release that. By the way, when they do go to lower energy, that is an exothermic process for the atom. It has to release that energy. Uh, that the electron is losing. And just like when they kind of go to a higher energy level, the electrons, that's an endothermic process for the atom as it has to gain that energy to allow the electrons to go uh, up to a. This would be obviously giving off that in an exothermic type of process. And the way the atom would in an endothermic process. Electromagnetic waves is the speed at which they travel, and they travel at the speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So that's a number that I'm sure they're going to want you to know as you continue your travels here in chemistry. That's roughly about 186,000 miles per second, which is pretty fast, I think. And speed of light is a constant. So that is something that you sort of always have available to you if you need it, uh, is that three times 10 to the eight meters per second. For electromagnetic waves, we could kind of use this equation, which is C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. That again is going to give us meters per second if we use it just like that. We could also rearrange this. And if we know the frequency, we could divide the speed of the light by the frequency, and that will give us our wavelength in meters. And if we know the wavelength, we could find the frequency by doing really the same calculation. And that will give us our frequency in reciprocal seconds. So those are three ways that this equation is sort of rearranged. And oftentimes you can't solve for any of those things uh, that are found in that particular equation. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Say it again. Uh, it's not really, there's not too much of a difference between that and the previous form. And this is the one most people will use because usually we're talking about electromagnetic radiation, uh, which will equal the speed of light. So, yeah. Other questions? 
So definitely uh, there's other one that looks just like that, but this is usually the one that you would use in this situation here, the one that's equal to basically the speed of light. Other questions? <clears throat> So why don't we try one here? Uh, what is the frequency for a wave uh, with a wavelength of 4.68 times 10 to the minus seven meters? Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so we're looking for the frequency. We have the wavelength. Uh, so we can't use our C is equal to our wavelength times our frequency. Here the wavelength is 4.68 times 10 to the minus seven meters. Again, it is in meters, which is what we want. Because C is, I'm going to make a correction because here they actually would like you to learn, I think, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is pretty close to 3 times 10 to the 8. But I believe that's the number they actually would like you to use for speed of light here. So I guess we'll use that number. Um, and again, it, the wavelength does need to be in meters. Is a so correctly. Um, so we'll go into this and solve for our frequency, which is our speed of light divided by our wavelength. So 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, 4.68 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. The meters cancel, and that's going to leave us reciprocal seconds left over. want to make sure you use your exponent button there and you're going to look at something like uh, 6.41 times 10 to the 14. Once again, the units will be one over seconds or you could write reciprocal seconds kind of like that if you like. <clears throat> Any questions on that one? All right, so why don't you try this one? What is the wavelength in nanometers uh, for a wave with a frequency of 5.6 times 10 to the 14th? It's a reminder, nano, I believe, 10 to the minus nine. Okay, so once again, um, this is kind of the same formula. C is equal to wavelength times frequency. Uh, in this case here, we do have the frequency, uh, which is 5.6 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Remember that one hertz is the same as a reciprocal second, which means that is 5.6 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal second. Looking for the wavelength, and once again, C is a constant, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So solving for our wavelength, which would be C divided by frequency, putting in our numbers here. Again, the seconds will cancel. That's in this case. And give us here uh, 5.35 times 10. The minus 7 meters. We're looking for nanometers. A reminder that 1 uh, nanometer would equal 10 to the minus 9 meters. Uh, we'll take our answer here in meters and do our conversion to nanometers. Remember that is one times 10 to the minus nine. And I'll get you something like 535 nanometers here. Questions on that calculation there. <clears throat> So we could use uh, C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency as long as we know one of them. Uh, we can calculate either the wavelength of that wave of light coming off or the frequency of it as well. So when we do have these electrons transitioning, like I said before, and uh, energy is coming off in the form of these waves and these photons of light, they may fall somewhere on what is referred to as the electromagnetic uh, spectrum here. And this is the electromagnetic spectrum. And when we look at it, we have wavelength up on top. So what we have going on over here is this is a longer wavelength. And as we've talked about, with that longer wavelength, uh, that's going to have a lower frequency and a lower energy. <clears throat> 
as opposed to over here, which is 10 to the minus 12, which is a much smaller wavelength, which will have a higher frequency and a higher energy. So when we look down here at this end, uh, we have things like the radio waves, uh, which is not too bad. Um, we listen to it in the car. As we move to the left here, we then have microwaves, uh, which has a lot more energy and has enough energy, for example, to uh, move water molecules really fast. Uh, so you can get your pizza in like three minutes when you heat it up in the microwave. Uh, next to that is infrared, which is a little bit more energy. And uh, that is sort of the area where you feel heat coming off of things in that infrared sort of spectrum. Then we have really the visible part of the spectrum, which is a little bit higher in energy. And the visible part of the spectrum is where we see colors uh, like our Roy G. Biv red, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, over there, blue, <laughs> indigo, and violet. And <clears throat> we could also see that in terms of the colors, like I mentioned before, there is a difference in energy here, about 700 nanometers or so. Uh, that's going to give us our red, which is lower in energy because it has a longer wavelength than about 400 nanometers, which is our bluish color here, which is going to be higher in energy. So uh, usually the visible part of spectrum is, like I said before, where we see colors. So as in the case, like I said, of fireworks or even like that water hitting the flame, um, or even like the flame test that we did way back when, experiment 16, uh, those were all exciting, those electrons. And as those electrons come to a lower energy state, they give off that energy. And if it comes in this sort of visible part of the spectrum, uh, that is where we see color coming off of it. Um, <clears throat> next to that is ultraviolet or UV, a little bit more energy as well. And why we wear sunblock, right? Uh, so if we don't get too burnt out there with from the rays, uh, x-rays, more energy, why they throw a lead vest on you and leave the room right when they shoot the x-ray. And lastly, gamma rays is just pure radiation. Um, it's basically uh, radioactive rays that have no charge, similar to neutrons, but really just pure, pure energy. So as we go on this picture, kind of from right to left, uh, we're increasing in energy. Um, you do need to know these, the electromagnetic spectrum. You need to know the sense of, uh, for example, putting things in order from like lowest energy to highest or longer wavelength to shorter wavelength, um, lower frequency to higher frequency. So you don't necessarily have to know exactly where all the numbers are for this class. Uh, but you do need to be able to kind of put those guys in order. That also includes the colors there in the visible part of the spectrum. So the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You need to be able to kind of put those in order the same sort of way, energy, wavelength, frequency. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> Now, as we've been talking about, uh, atoms and molecules could emit or absorb energy in these discrete sort of bundles of energy they're sometimes referred to. And again, that's our quantum of energy. And really, you can think of it, as I mentioned earlier, that it's the idea that these electrons will either gain enough energy or lose enough energy to, again, fully transition from one energy level to the next. And it may be multiple energy levels. It may transition from, it may be less energy levels as well, uh, but they will gain nonetheless enough energy to make the full sort of transition. You could actually calculate the amount of energy by using this formula here. This is the energy is equal to H times the frequency. H is Planck's constant and that is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Joules is the unit of energy. Seconds, obviously, is time. And if you think about sort of that equation and the one that we saw earlier, which is our C is equal to our wavelength times our frequency. And if I solve for my frequency, I uh, would be C divided by wavelength. I could actually substitute that into here. And you'll sometimes see this equation as HC divided by the wavelength. 
So the energy is equal to HC divided by the wavelength, or the energy is equal to H times the frequency. What that means is, frankly, if you know one of those two things, either you know the frequency, the light coming off, or you know the wavelength of the light coming off, you could calculate the energy associated with that photon by using these formulas as H is a constant and also C is a constant as well. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Once again, here, wavelength does need to be in meters for everything to properly cancel out. So why don't we try one here? What is the energy associated with a wave that has a wavelength of 465 nanometers? So give it a go, see what you come up with here. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, we are looking for our energy in this case. Uh, we have a wavelength of 465 nanometers. So we do have our energies equal to H times our frequency, which once again also equals HC divided by the wavelength. So we would want to use sort of this version of it as C over the wavelength equals the frequency since that's all we have is really our wavelength in this case. We do have to convert it uh, to meters. So we'll take our 465 nanometers, again, one nanometer, 10 to the minus nine meters. So that's gonna get us there, 465 times 10 to the minus nine, gonna give us uh, 4.65 times 10 to the minus seven meters. The reason we need to do that, H, I'll use 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Sometimes people might use 6.626, but we'll use this one. C, we'll use a 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Once again, it does need to be in meters because of the speed of uh, correctly. Uh, putting this in, we'll take our uh, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds, our 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, all divided by our wavelength, which has been converted into meters. So everything cancels, little canceling action there. Seconds will also cancel. That's gonna leave us just joules. So 6.63 minus 34 times 2.998 to the eight divided by our wait 4.27 looks like times 10 to the minus 19 joules here in this case. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> so once again, all you need is the wavelength or the frequency, and you can calculate the energy associated with that photon of light. Any questions on that calculation? <clears throat> All right, one last one here. What is the energy uh, associated with a wave that has a frequency of 2.87 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds? Equals H times the frequency. In this case, we were given the frequency. And we're looking for the energy. So we really do have everything we need. Planck, again, is a constant. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. So just plugging it in here. Times our frequency here, 2.87 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds. So that's one over seconds, which means those guys will cancel out and we'll end up uh, with, making sure again, exponent button here. 1.90. Question on that calculation there. <clears throat> All right. So using these formulas, very common, again, to calculate energy, wavelength, frequency. Obviously, as well, if you have the energy associated with a photon of light, uh, you could use these equations to calculate the frequency or wavelength of that photon that came off. Any questions on that calculation? <clears throat>
All right. So what we're really talking about here is, as I mentioned earlier, is the idea of electrons really sort of transitioning from one energy level to the next. And as I mentioned before, pretty much most uh, things like to be in the lowest possible state of energy. So when electrons do get excited through an endothermic process, when the atom gains energy, like, for example, when you stick your uh, thing in the flame, when you do a flame test, it gains all that energy. Uh, what happens is, again, those electrons go to a higher energy level, but they really do want to sort of relax themselves back down to a lower energy level, again, to give off that energy in an exothermic process as they are lowering their energy levels, those electrons. Again, depending on where that comes off, we may see a color light. Now, just to be clear, all transition of electrons does not necessarily result in you seeing light coming off because that just means it came off in the visible part of that spectrum. It could come off in the infrared part of the spectrum, the UV part, any of those parts of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum that we saw earlier, and you may not see color obviously coming off as a result of those electron transitioning. So sometimes people always think it's got to always be like uh, some type of color that you as a transition but it really depends on where it comes off in that spectrum. And if it doesn't come off in that visible part of the spectrum, you will not see color, in, but it may still be coming off in some other part of that spectrum. So this brings us to the idea of what we see sometimes when we look at a spectrum. And one of the early theories was Bohr's theory of the hydrogen atom. And it was used a lot to explain what is sometimes referred to as an emission spectrum of what we see come off as electrons get excited to higher energy levels and come back down. So an emission spectrum is basically uh, what it sounds like. It's a result of electrons transitioning from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. And what you see as a result of the atom giving off that energy in the form of a photon of light. There's also an absorption spectrum, which we don't talk about too much, but that's the opposite process when the atom gains energy and the electrons go up higher in uh, energy. Now, there's two types of spectrums that you sometimes will see. Uh, a substance may give off a continuous spectrum, and pretty much what it sounds like is pretty much what's happening there. A continuous spectrum is basically you're going to see pretty much everything coming off all at once. Uh, it can really stop anywhere along the way, as opposed to a line spectrum, which also is much like it sounds like you see very distinct lines at specific wavelengths and, for example, have specific colors associated with it. The difference between those two spectrums is how energy is sort of given off and absorbed. In a continuous spectrum, uh, you could think of it like a ramp. So we did like the staircase earlier. You think about like walking up a ramp in a continuous spectrum. If you're walking up a ramp, you pretty much can lay up, you know, anywhere you like as you're walking up the ramp, right? You could kind of stop anywhere you like. And that's different than our sort of quantized energy that we see with atoms and elements, which is more of that staircase model where, again, as I said earlier, you actually have to be on one sort of step or the other. So the difference in that is in a continuous spectrum, because you can kind of lay up anywhere, you pretty much get everything possibly coming out here because you can only be here the electron for example or here the electron or there the electron we get these very distinct lines that come off in the spectrum that correlate to the energy level at which those electrons sort of find themselves ending up Any questions on that there <clears throat> so obviously to get an emission spectrum you have to energize the sample which will energize the electrons like i said you could use a flame uh, you could use heat, obviously. Uh, you could also uh, use something like an electrical current, uh, electrical discharge tube, like a neon light or something like that, right? It's electricity running through there. It's going to excite up all the electrons and give off, for example, those colors you see in like neon signs and stuff like that as well. So as I mentioned before, not all uh, transitions will be necessary in the visible part of the spectrum. But when we look at something like an iron bar, uh, we do see the red hot of it as it's sort of glowing. Uh, the warmth is also filled, which is part of that infrared part of the spectrum. Now, a common feature for the sun and heated solids is they are continuous. All the wavelengths of light are represented in the spectrum. Again, that's more of the ramp type theory. As you're going up, you can pretty much stop anywhere.
along the way. Now, an emission spectrum of atoms in their gas phase do not show a continuous uh, spread of wavelength. They do see this more distinct lines happening uh, from an or visible part of the spectrum. This is called a line spectrum. And a line spectrum is so unique that every element has its own line spectrum in the sense of how many lines you see, uh, what wavelength they're at, what colors that you typically see. You can identify what element you're looking at based on when you look at it. And you typically could look at this through, through like a spectroscope. It's got like a little prism in there. It'll separate out the light and you'll see these distinct sort of lines coming out at these distinct wavelengths. So you can really identify the element you're dealing with based on really what you see in these line spectrums. So here, for example, if you have a hydrogen discharge tube, it's gonna go through this little slit. It has a prism. It will separate out the light and you will see, as you can see here, these distinct lines that represent, each of those lines represent electrons and hydrogen that are transitioning from different energy levels. Uh, once again, we see one over here in purple, which means that's probably transitioning a lot more energy levels because that's gonna be higher in energy. As opposed to over here, we see more of an orangey type color and that's gonna be a little bit lower in energy, which means maybe that electron's only transitioning from a very close energy level to the next, not gonna give off as much energy. And here's a thing of that, I think. When the light emitted by a hydrogen gas discharge tube is passed through a prism, a line spectrum results. This line spectrum consists of light at only four wavelengths in the visible region. And again, uh, that is, again, a result of uh, each of these electrons transitioning from different energy levels. And in this case, it's an emission spectrum. So what we're seeing is as they drop down, that energy coming off is going to correspond to each of these sort of lines that we see come off. Now, this is the line spectrum for hydrogen, which would look very different than, say, the line spectrum from krypton or neon or something like that, they would have different lines. They may have some of the similar colors, uh, but they would have it coming off at different wavelengths, so slightly different wavelengths as well. And this brings us to Bohr and his idea of the Bohr model of our theory of the hydrogen atom. And because it is a theory, as we talked about way back when, uh, it may not be correct in all aspects and it's really not. So uh, Bohr's model is, uh, very complex. We're not going to get in great detail about it all, but it does account for those four lines that we do see in the line spectrum from hydrogen. What was found with Bohr's model is as you moved away from, say, something like hydrogen that had more than one electron, uh, it didn't really hold up all that well. So, But it worked really well to sort of explain those four lines that we see in hydrogen. But again, as you move away from anything with one more than one electron, uh, it doesn't necessarily hold up. And that's the idea of a theory, as we talked about. It may be thought of as being correct, but revisited later, may be found that not all aspects of it is correct. So what is Bohr's model? Bohr's model is basically the planetary sort of model of the atom. And his idea, we had our nucleus, and we had these orbits around our nucleus. Very badly drawn orbits. And for example, we have like n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, and these are different energy levels. And basically, that it's kind of rotating around orbits uh, and these nice circular patterns. And basically, he used the idea that what we're seeing spectrum is, for example, this electron say out here transitioning. And once again, that's going to correspond to uh, one of those lines that we see in the hydrogen spectrum. That is going to be a quantized energy where the energy would equal H times the frequency here uh, associated with that. The problem with this is, as we will talk about, electrons really don't move in these nice pretty circles where you could just like put your finger there and know eventually it'll just come like around the corner and it will come around the circle. Uh, they travel pretty randomly, as we'll talk about. Uh, so that's why we sort of move away from this model uh, in a bit here. But at this point, that's sort of Bohr's idea.
we have these electrons that are restricted to these orbits. They're either traveling around in a certain orbit or they gain or lose enough energy to transfer to another orbit where they're then going to be kind of circling around uh, the nucleus. And <clears throat> what we see here again is as they transition from one energy level to the next, that is what's accounting for those different color lines that we see. Now, when we talk about these different energy levels, they are sometimes referred to as N. And N is the principal quantum number. And the principal quantum number, there's actually four quantum numbers, which when you take two, one A, whatever they call it here, when you take one A, uh, you'll learn about the four quantum numbers. Uh, but N is the energy level, basically. So when we talk about the ground state, or the ground level, that's N equals one. That's the lowest energy you could have. That's kind of the most stable. It's the closest to the nucleus. It's the lowest as you could get there. Anything above N equals one, N equals two, three, four, five, six, seven, and from like two to seven, uh, N typically is one through seven is basically where it runs, um, is considered excited states. And excited states are further away from the nucleus. They are higher in energy. Um, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about, you know, an electron went from like, you know, the N equals. Say N equals five and dropped all the way down to say N equals two. Once again, that's going to require energy to be given off in the form of a photon of light. That's a pretty big transition, which if it was a color, would maybe be towards the blue-violet side as it's more energy. As opposed to, again, if we saw a transition of, say, this electron on the second energy level to just the first energy level, not as big of an energy transition. And again, if it was coming off in the visible part of the spectrum, maybe closer towards the red side of that uh, visible part of spectrum where we might see the color sort of come off. Any questions on that there? <laughs> and there is what you can see there, uh, just a one sort of energy level transition. Maybe it accounts for that red and blue, a little bit longer of an energy transition. And this is the idea from Bohr, these kind of four transitions all account for our different colors that we see in the hydrogen atom. Obviously, the longer transitions would be more towards the blue side of the spectrum in those lines. And again, the shorter transitions would be closer to the red side. And as I mentioned before, difference in terms of energy of continuous versus quantized, B is quantized, which is what basically atoms and stuff do. Again, you got to either be here, gain enough energy to be here, here, or here, as opposed to here, which is more of a continuous, like my ramp explanation. Pretty much you could stop anywhere along the way, which is why we see everything sort of come off uh, basically at once. <clears throat> ramp versus our stair example there. So let's talk a little bit then about the way mechanical model and as I mentioned before, Bohr's model of the atom worked really well to explain really those four sort of electrons that we saw in the hydrogen atom, but it did fall apart a little bit as you moved away from one electron. And a lot of work was done on one of the earlier sort of work, which I guess is more theory work. He actually didn't do experiments. It was later proven by other people. But uh, this was the idea of uh, de Broglie and... It was this dual nature of the electron. Again, when we're talking about electrons, which is a particle, uh, it was thought of like, you know what, even though it is a particle, it can have this sort of wave-like function. And the Broglie, sort of it as a standing wave. Um, the idea. That wave is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to really travel. It just, and it's sort of like a standing wave in that sense. And he related that to how an electron is sort of moving around in the atom in relationship to the nuclear. So, if you remember, like, 
charge or electron is negatively charged. So there is going to be that attraction that's going to hold the electron there, right? And not allow the electron just to fly off and keep going. And that's sort of the idea like your guitar string, right? You can pluck it as much as you want. Again, not going to kind of move. The electron, although it may be moving around, uh, is not going to fly off and sort of leave the atom unless something causes it to do so. So he sort of uh, said that a light wave, um, a light ray can behave like a stream of particles or photons. Then particles can also have this wave-like character. And according to him, like I said, uh, an electron is bound to the nucleus like a standing wave. Uh, it's what sort of keeps it there, that attractive force. But it has this sort of wave-like function, which means it could have wave-like characteristics. And that's going to be really important as we are moving away from Bohr's idea of these orbits. And we just have these particles moving around in circles in these orbits. Uh, they're just kind of moving and rotating around in a circle to this idea that really electrons aren't moving in this fashion. So in, term, uh, in terms of De Broglie's uh, idea here, uh, there are certain points along that sort of wave, which has really no amplitude. And that's what's sometimes referred to as a node. And you could kind of think of it almost like, you know, the uh, where you'd find like the nucleus if you're sort of kind of looking at it. Um, De Broglie reasoned that waves can have a particle-like function and also exhibit wave function as well. So again, back to that sort of dual nature of light. Uh, it could be like a wave, could be a particle. They exhibit similar sort of characteristics under these conditions. The next really big sort of idea of moving away from uh, the Bohr model of the atom and certainty that I know there's an electron in this orbit, I know it's traveling in this pretty little circles, is the idea brought on by uh, Heisenberg and it's the Heisenberg certainty principle. And it basically says that it's impossible to know simultaneously the momentum and the position of a particle like an electron. And actually, as you know more about a particle in the sense of how it's moving, uh, the less you know about its location and vice versa, the more you know about its location, the less you actually know about how it's moving. So this was a very big step to move away from Bohr's idea of, I know my electron, like I said, is in this pretty orbit, it's doing circles, and if I wanna put my finger there, I know eventually it's going to come back around and it'll be traveling into me. And we're moving away from this idea to, well, electrons are in that empty space. There's definitely some tie into the nucleus. It could have wave-like function, which means we're going to get some random sort of around the nucleus in this empty space. We really don't know how exactly it's moving. We don't know exactly where it is at any given a point in time. The best that we could do is really this idea of probability. And the idea of probability was brought on by as well, uh, Schrodinger and his equations, which if you take physical chemistry ever, that's a bunch of it devoted to that. Not fun, you don't wanna do that. Um, but maybe, you do. I don't know. But uh, we move away from this idea, like I said, of Bohr, and for sure they're moving around these circles, to this idea of I'm not really sure where they are. I'm not really sure kind of how they're moving. But I do know that there should be certain places within the atom that there is a high probability that you could find an electron. So if you just think about, again, our atom, which is obviously our nucleus in the center that's positively charged, there should be a pretty good probability that somewhere near the nucleus, there should be a high probability of finding an electron. Don't know how it got there. Not really sure how it's moving, but I know that because the nucleus is positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, there's probably a fairly good opportunity that at some point you could probably find an electron near that nucleus. Obviously, as we know as well, as you sort of Nucleus, your probability is probably going to start to decrease, right? Because you're farther away from the nucleus. Uh, there's probably a probability of finding an atom. 
So with Schrodinger sort of idea, along with Heisenberg and de Broglie, we actually move away from Bohr's idea of electrons are in these pretty little orbits doing circles to this idea of, I'm not really sure how it's moving, not really sure where it's moving or where it's located, but I know that the probability of where it's at is in what is sometimes referred to as an orbital or an atomic orbital. And an orbital or an atomic orbital is really just a probability map of where in the atom you could affect, expect to find an electron located. As we will talk about, there's a few different types of atomic orbitals. There are S orbitals, there are P orbitals, there are D orbitals, and there are F. And each of these have some different shapes as we'll look at, and they're really still, again, probability maps of Again, I think there's a really good probability of finding an electron in this area. But again, I'm not really sure how it got there. I'm not sure how it's moving. I'm not sure when it's going to be there. I just know if it should eventually kind of be in that area. Now, when we talk about an atomic orbital, one important aspect of an atomic orbital or just an orbital in general is it can maximally hold two electrons. So the maximum number of electrons that any individual atomic orbital could hold is basically two electrons. <clears throat> well, not there. So here is sort of a probability map. Think of the nucleus there in the center. I guess red on red is not the best choice there. I'll show us a different color there. So you can kind of think of like the nucleus sort of there. of where you could locate an electron. And as you can see, as you sort of fan out from the nucleus, it gets lighter and lighter. And those are lower probabilities of where you could find an electron. But once again, this idea of atomic orbitals is our electron is moving pretty randomly about in that free space. And again, there's just these areas where there's a higher probability of finding an electron uh, versus other areas. But more about each of these atomic orbitals so starting at the first energy level, which is the n equals one, that is where s orbit. Uh, energy level, which is n equals one, and they're found at all energy levels. So if you go to the next energy level, n equals two, there's a two s orbital. The one means it's on the first energy level. The two means it's on the second. As you might imagine, if you go to the third, it's called a 3s orbital because it's on the third energy level. Uh, so you'll find s's on every energy level. There's only one type of s orbitals. So no matter what energy level you end up on, there's only one type of s orbital, which means the maximum number of electrons an s orbital could hold is two electrons so that's really important so again an s orbital no matter which level you're at the 1s orbital the 2s orbital the 3s the 4s the 5s the 6s the 7s uh, the maximum number of electrons that you could put in there if these arrows represent electrons are two it's basically that's and it is filled basically can't take any more electrons at that point here is what a S orbital looks like. Again, it's merely a spherical, spherical shape with the nucleus at the center. And again, that is sort of the probability map of where we would find sort of the electron in that area. And as you can see here, S orbitals, no matter what energy level you're on, on S is the N equals one energy level, the lowest. That's on the n equals 2 to n equals 3 energy level. They're all the same sort of shape. They do get larger to accommodate all the electrons that come before them, uh, but they basically all have the same shape with sort of the idea of the nucleus sort of in the middle of it. The next type of orbitals that are important actually start on the second energy level. So on the first energy level, there is only the s orbital. On the second energy level, we still have our s orbital, 
but that is where we start to see our p orbitals first start to appear. And for example, they're referred to as a 2p orbital. And there's actually three of them. Uh, there's 2p, x, y, and z. And that's like in three-dimensional space and math on the x, y, and z axis here in three-dimensional space. P orbitals basically kind of look like teardrops or figure eights is basically where they're at with kind of like the nucleus thought of as sort of in that area, that point of a node where there's no amplitude. And again, you can have some electrons over here, or electrons over here. It can hold a maximum of two electrons. When we take all three of these individual P orbitals together, those are what are sometimes referred to as a subshell or sublevel. And that would be sometimes referred to in this specific case as a 2P subshell or 2P sublevel is a grouping of, say, P orbitals together. Now, because there are three different types of P orbitals, And because you could fill them up here, that would be a maximum number of how many electrons? Three times two is six electrons if you filled up the 2P subshell or really any P subshell on any level. So what I mean by that, if we just look at the 2P subshell here, it would be filled when we put two electrons in each, two, four, and six electrons would fill up the entire 2P subshell. Do you need to fill up the entire 2P subshell? You do not, uh, but if you need to continue on, you need to fill it up first. So you would have to go through all of those. So when we're talking about sort of electrons at this point, we would start always at the lowest energy. So our first two electrons would go into the 1S, our next two, if we had them, would go into the 2s, and our next six electrons before it'd be filled would go into our 2p. And again, that's how we sort of fill electrons in there. And again, you don't necessarily have to fill up an entire subshell. We do not necessarily refer to as an s as a subshell because it's just made up of one orbital. So we just usually call it an s orbital. With P's, we do sometimes refer to them as subshell. And when they are referred to as subshells, they are talking about all three of them together. Now, if they're talking about a 2P orbital, they're talking about one individual orbital out of those three. So it's very important, those sort of words. Sometimes people get them confused uh, when they're asked about electrons. So here's the uh, 2PX. As you can see, the X orbital is the shape of a figure eight along the X axis. And here's the 2PY. The 2PY orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the Y axis. And again, you can kind of think of the nucleus there between the two lobes there as the, where you would find the nucleus. And there's our 2PZ orbital. The 2PZ orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the Z axis. And again, you could have an electron kind of in any of those two spots there. So as you can see here, sort of thinking this is where the nucleus is. This is our kind of high probability of where we're going to find electrons on either side. And again, each of these could hold a maximum of two electrons for a grand total of six electrons for our 2P subshell. By the way, as we will talk about, they actually do go into those orbitals actually one at a time, and then they come back and pair off. So that's how sort of the electrons go into subshells where there's multiple orbitals. They actually will go in one at a time, and then when they run out of room, they'll come back and pair off uh, until they're fully full at that point. Any questions on that there? That brings us to D orbitals, and D orbitals actually do not appear until we get to the third energy level. So once again, on the first energy level, we have a 1s. On the second, we have a 2s and our 2p subshell. On the third, we have a 3s, a 3p, and that is where we first start to see our 3d subshell. 
And there are five different D orbitals. As you can see here, most of them look like a couple of P orbitals together. And one looks like a donut with a P orbital kind of going through the middle. Because there are five individual d orbitals, they could hold a maximum of 10 electrons if you fill the d subshell. And once again, that's going to be an electron in each. And then coming back and pairing everybody up. And that gives you 10 electrons that you could actually fill the entire d subshell. <clears throat> And again, does not start to appear until you hit the third energy level, basically. Any questions on that there? And again, basically, each of these pictures down here could hold two electrons each. Now, to finish up in terms of the orbitals, one last set of orbitals, or here's the Ds. 3D x squared minus y squared orbital has a cloverleaf shape that lies in the xy plane and is aligned along the x and y axis. Get the idea. The 3DZ squared orbital is shaped like a PZ orbital with a donut of electron density around the center. It is aligned with a Z axis. The last type of orbitals actually appear on the fourth energy level, and these are F orbitals. So once again, on the first energy level, we have our 1S, second, 2S, and our 2P. Third, 3s, 3p. Oops, so I'll make that one. There we go. Our 3d. And on the fourth, we still have a 4s, a 4p, a 4d. And right here with seven of them is where I ran out of room, but there should be seven lines there, is where our. 4F subshell basically uh, starts. As you can see, it's kind of like a couple of Ds together. And there are seven different F orbitals, which means if you fill the F subshell of all seven of those orbitals, you're going to max out at 14 electrons. So S orbitals, you're going to max out at two electrons. P subshells, six electrons. Uh, D subshells, 10 electrons, and F subshells, 14 electrons. And if you know pretty much the letters and how many maximum electrons, as we'll talk about where we're going with this, is to write electron configuration. You'll be able to write any electron configuration you need to know. Any questions on that there? All right, we'll lay it up there for today.